I think we'd rather not speak to Willie Nelson or, uh, <laughs> although we love him. Welcome, everyone. My name is David Jordan. I have the honor of being one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church of Decatur. We are thrilled to be able to host this event tonight. We are also thrilled to be partners in the endeavor of sharing stories and the power of literature and what books can do for how our vision can be changed and how we see the world and one another. I want to thank the Georgia Center for the Book and Joe Davich and Ellie Wright for their partnership and helping to make this happen, as well as the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Tony Clark. Tony will be facilitating the Q&A in just a few moments. We're so grateful for uh, their good work and partnership as well. And also Acapella Books, Frank Rice and the Rice family, and the many ways that our community is enriched by each of these partners here for this event tonight. In a few moments, Rick will be sharing with you the power of his story and his life and the people of his life. He will have a Q&A at the conclusion of his remarks. He will need to leave immediately after that Q&A and partly due to COVID and some other issues, we just ask for your understanding in that. Uh, his books are already signed, so you don't need him. He's done the work already and is thrilled, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so uh, just know that after the Q&A, he will need to, to leave, but the books are signed and ready for you. Rick Bragg, a couple of folks were saying not long ago, he's kind of the, the Johnny Cash of the literary world. And no, 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 another one said, no, he's a Hank Williams of the literary world. Both of them are wrong. While, Rick, you tell the stories of regular folks, hardworking people, I think more appropriate is you are the Chopin of the literary world. Chopin, you know, took, like Johnny Cash and Hank Williams, the lives of regular people and the music of the common folk and turned it in to remarkable magic. And Ricky, that's what you do with words for us. You take common people, and through your artistry, you allow them to be us, and us to be them. And you change the way we see the world, and we thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to invite Rick Bragg to this platform this evening for our hearing pleasure. Thank you, Rick. I guess the Chopin of American literature will take off his mask now. <laughs> but, but we had a deacon's meeting out back to decide that was okay. So... Uh, Pastor, I, I appreciate that. I mean that. That may be the kindest and most eloquent thing anybody's ever said. I mean that from the heart. Uh, if I had his voice, I could have made something of myself. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean? I mean, God, I, you just hear those folks, that voice sounds like it's coming out of the bottom of a well, you know, it's just, I just wish I could do that. Uh, I had, the, it was not a, a smooth beginning here because I had to do some paperwork about the recording. And rec the paperwork involved 97 signatures. And I got to thinking, if you got to sign 97 times to get a recording done, how do you ever get anybody baptized? <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. A, disclaimers, what if water goes up their nose? 
B, and this is serious, what if it don't take? <laughs> is there protection built into the contract that will allow you a do-over? And I know for a fact, Pastor, that sometimes once don't get it done. <laughs> and uh, right, yeah. Yeah, I see you nodding your heads like you think that's witty, but you know you, you're, you've been there yourself. <laughs> but uh, thank you all from the heart. I mean it. Tony and the folks at the Center for the Book and over at the Carter Center. And, and quite frankly, this has become home away from home. Hey, did y'all do something to like get sent to the balcony? Did, did y'all not fill out the form? <laughs> they probably didn't fill out the form. Uh, I, it's funny, even I sound good in here, Pastor. Isn't this a great, isn't this a great place? Uh, but I, this book was not intended um, to be a serious book. Uh, I was, uh, I'd had some health trouble of my own. You know, I had uh, non-Hodgkin's and um, then some other things that go along with not taking care of yourself for 62 years. And uh, so I needed an easy book, you know. And authors won't admit to this, but but they'll, Every now and then they'll just say, man, I need to do something easy. And uh, I was standing in the backyard of my mama's cabin, 40 acres of mountain pasture, one of the most beautiful places on this planet. And I got it for her with a, with a book. Um, she didn't like the first house I bought her because she said it, quote, hun, it has too many light bulbs, unquote. <laughs> So I got her this farm and uh, I was standing in the back one day. It was one of them gray days, you know, those ambiguous days in the deep south where you don't know if it's winter or spring. And, uh, and I saw this dog up on the ridgeline and Strays wind up at our house all the time. And if they are too wounded or too sick to move on, we keep them. We take care of them. And so I saw him up on that ridge line. It was probably, you know, 75 yards away, maybe more. And uh, I admit that uh, it's a whole lot less trouble if they just move on. And that doesn't make me a good person or a bad person. Um, and the next day he was still there and it looked like he had not moved. And the next day he was there. So I got a half a loaf of raisin bread, which is the worst thing in the world to give a dog, right? Sugar is awful for dogs. And I got half a loaf of raisin bread and put on my duck hunter's coat and walked up the hill and, uh, oh man, he was awful. He had starved and he had been, he had been a pack dog. Some people call them wild dogs, but I think people call wild dogs wild dogs just so they can justify ignoring them, you know? And uh, I had seen him. He, he was a... a one of those dogs that was a little bit bigger maybe than the other strays and was maybe meaner and kind of ran at the front and got the best of the food. He'd been out there for months, maybe longer, and uh, that he was finished. I mean, he was uh, emaciated and tore all to pieces and bleeding. And, and it was clear what had happened, that he had fought and lost and they had run him out, which happens. 
Anna. So I, I knew it was a bad idea, but my people in my family are not careful. We are not cautious men. And uh, so I scooped him up. He didn't wait nothing and toted him home. And uh, I'll read you what happened next. I don't read a lot. Y'all know me. Y'all been around enough to know I don't, don't read a lot. But, but for an easy book, I was kind of proud of this one. I believe that you can't be a, a, a successful writer in the South unless you write with a certain amount of richness. And, and uh, uh, how many of you just, out of, how many of y'all have ever had a rice cake? You know, those things you buy in the grocery store, you know? Do you like it? <laughs> how many of you have ever had sausage gravy on a biscuit? I think that you should write like sausage gravy on a biscuit. <laughs> the driveway is a winding quarter mile, a dim green tunnel through tangled pines and mountain pasture, fractured by dappled sunlight on the clear, hot days. Flashes of color of blue jays, yellowhammers, and an emerald blur of hummingbirds crisscross the rusted barbed wire. And mocking birds touched down on cedar posts that were cut from this mountain a hundred years before. White-tailed deer and wild turkey like periscopes spy over tall, sharp blades of Johnson grass. And white egrets, rare here in the red dirt up so high, pose on one leg in the flat brown water of the pond. And it all seems painted on somehow as if someone dreamed it up on a slow day with an easy mind and hung it on the air. Then he rumbles in and goes to raising all kinds of hell. The dog running half blind, tongue out and wide open, intercepts my truck halfway up the drive and the wild things scattered to the corners of the earth. He yells, twists and bounces to a hard stop right on some mark only he can find usually smack dab in a red ant bed or mud hole, but always safely away from the main road, as if he can remember all the meanness and suffering there and knows this mountain is his sanctuary and his last stand. Run too far, he thinks, and you fall off the world. I know this is reading a lot into a dog who falls asleep in his food bowl, suffers a shivering apoplexy when you rub his belly and acts as if every wayward possum is a sign of the end of times. <laughs> but I don't think any dog knows home better than one thrown away once already. This is, though, pretty much the sum of his intelligence. He seems to forget every waking day that a one-ton truck is not to be messed with and biting at the spinning tires, tries to herd me up the driveway like a big sparkly cow. He'll move, people say, because everyone is an expert when it's not their dog in the road. But I can never recall which side his bad eye is on. So I stomp the brake and twist the wheel and finally lurching and cursing. I'm sorry, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> arrive at the cabin at the top of the hill. I swing open the door and the dog, 76 pounds of wet hair and poor decisions. <laughs> Obviously y'all got that dog too. <laughs> Lunges in, eternally surprised and overjoyed that it is me. I yell, get down, but too late. The truck's cab is already tattooed in dirt, mud, or biting ants because he needs to squirm to within an inch of my face to be sure. I might have been the UPS or the man from Cherokee Electric 
who has learned to bring a stick. <laughs> then with a growl, he is off to molest the livestock and stir a general panic. He is a herding dog by blood, an illegitimate Australian shepherd, and he bolts into the pasture to create a small stampede. He evades the thumping hooves by inches, but always gets caught up in a never-ending circle because he's got one bad eye <laughs> and cannot find his way out again like a drunk teenager doing donuts in a parking lot. I stumble after him, yelling, threatening, and he hunkers down and covers his eyes with his paws. I used to think he did that out of shame, but now I know he believes this makes him invisible. <laughs> Recently, I came home from a week-long trip to find the driveway peaceful and empty, the terrible dog nowhere around. It always made me a little nervous when he didn't rush down to meet me. As much as any creature I've ever known, he lives one blink away from extinction. My brother Sam was in the barn beating an old tractor, an old Yanmar with a hammer. It had run hot again and scalded him, so he was ill-tempered and short, which is his most natural state. I don't know if he is working on it, are just getting even. You seen my dog, I asked. He's in jail, he said. <laughs> Bam! He's in jail again. In the dog's first month here, he was incarcerated 29 times. <laughs> telling him to behave even after two years is like telling him it is Tuesday. What, I asked, did he do now? Run the mule, my brother said. I told him that was not so bad, a dog running one solitary mule. Run the mule, he said. Run the donkeys. Run them half to death. Run them round and round the pasture, biting at their legs. Run them till they went to blowing and bucking and screaming and tried to kick him to death. Don't know where he wanted them to go. Don't think he did. Bam! What else, I ask? Because there's always something else. Drag part of an old dead deer up to the house, he said. Laid there chewing on the leg bone by the kitchen window. You can still smell it. He paused to let his contempt gather like an old creaky train cresting a hill. Picked a fight with Mama's puppy. Stole the puppy's ball and took it off and buried it. When I fed him, he wouldn't let the puppy eat. Went and laid in the puppy's bowl and growled. He pointed to a puddle in the middle of the garage floor. He peed on the tractor. He peed on my truck. He peed on Mama's flowers. So Mama told me to lock him up. He set down the hammer and picked up a wrench. He twisted it grimly on a rusted bolt like he was tightening a noose and realized he had left something out. He eat all the cat food Mama put out. Cats flying everywhere. <laughs> I laughed and he shot me a dirty look. He does not even like cats, which have no practical use. How he must loathe my dog to take the sight of a cat. <laughs> he went back to pounding on the tractor, grumbling around a big dip of snuff. I could only make out about every third word, but the gist, I believe, was I never should have let the dog take root here in the first place. You got to train a dog, got to make a mind, he said, making it plain that everything wrong with my dog was my fault. I tried to train the dog for years, but had failed. Giving him a command of any kind was fruitless, bordering on stupid. I might as well read him the Song of Hiawatha. 
or sing on Wisconsin. I had to heave him into the truck like a sack of fertilizer every time I took him to the veterinarian. That or lure him in with cold cuts. And I always have to, for some reason, they never have any trouble getting him in jail. You know, I mean, if I tried to do it, he would like, he will bite me. And, uh, and, I, and so I asked, you know, I said, how did, did y'all get him in? How'd you, and the jail is the kennel. You know, it's not like a gulag. I mean, it's a kennel. <laughs> I said, how'd y'all get him in? And my mama answered through the screen door. She said, I made him a mayonnaise sandwich. And he walked right in. It was the grave robbing, they all agreed, that sealed it. They could forgive the rest of it, even a certain amount of careless urination. He was a boy dog after all. But if there was a corpse of any kind close by, one left lying by a careless deer hunter or hastily covered over by some poacher, he would find it, dig it up, drag it here, and gnaw on it. The closest human cemetery was, thankfully, several miles away. So it was always a four-legged cadaver of some kind that he brought into the yard. Still, I sometimes wondered if I'd come home one evening and find him tugging by the dress hem, someone's dear departed Aunt Lurleen. <laughs> I got a flashlight from my truck and followed the circle of light down the path to the pen. When you walked here in hot weather, you walked in a kind of southern rainforest amid the creeping vines and poison ivy and the big black and yellow spiders, webs dripping silver and air so heavy, it seemed held up by faith alone. The hum of insects and the trilling of frogs, a million at least, sang out of the dark and glowing specks of lightning bugs winked on and off. They were flying low that night, just above the high grass. My grandma used to say that meant it was going to rain. And there, in that twinkling light, guilty as sin and one eye shining, was my dog. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted it to be an easy book. Um, my uh, brother Sam, who has been the uh, backbone of all my stories. My mama was a heart of them, but my brother Sam was the muscle. Um, he passed away in spring from uh, pancreatic cancer. And he he uh, fought it for a year and a half. And I always used to, it used to make me mad when people would say someone fought cancer because I, you know, I knew that you know, there was medicine and, and, and so much science involved. And, um, but he fought it. And, uh, and I was not going to write about the death of my brother in a dog book. So, um, but the dog and my brother... My brother did not, as you can tell, did not like my dog. And, <laughs> and, but when he got sick, the dog knew. The same way he knew when my mother, my mother lost all her family during COVID. Not from COVID, but every one of her brothers and sisters, brothers-in-law, people that helped raise me, they all left this world during COVID. And uh, so she, the last of that great family that I've written about for for 40 years is, is gone. And uh, she's the last alive. And uh, so the dog would sit by her and let her talk, you know? The worst dog in the world figured that out. 
And when Sam got sick, the worst dog in the world would sit against his knee. So it wasn't an easy book. I didn't write about Sam's passing. Um, I finished the book while he was still on his tractor out in the pasture. And, uh, but the dog, but I also, and it's frivolous compared to what all we have lost, but I was not going to write a dead dog book. I was not going to write a book about a dog that perished. They all perish because the, the arc of human life, as you know, and believe this is about as deep as I'm ever going to get, so don't miss it. Uh, Pastor, it's a good thing y'all are recording this. Maybe, maybe that's why that damn form was that long. But uh, that gummit, I wasn't going to cuss in the church. I wasn't going to cuss in the church. That's the second time that that has happened. That's the second time it's happened in this church on this carpet. Uh, but I, um, I just couldn't do it, you know. Um, so I even told my, my literary agent is, is the, 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 I've said she's the meanest woman to ever draw breath, but she's mean on my behalf, so I love her. And, uh, and I told her, I said, look, I don't want to do this book if, if the dog, and, you know, the dog flirts with disaster. I don't want to do it if that happens. But right now, the dog is sitting on the edge of the couch watching the Virginian with my mama. <laughs> And um, I mean, he's just useless in, in, in all ways except that, you know. But what a blessing, you know, to have around. I don't use that word very much, but uh, yeah, he's, well, he's not right in the head is what he is. But, <laughs> but, but let's, I would rather, and I've said, y'all know I say this all the time. Uh, I'd rather talk with you than talk at you. So, and ladies, I'm just kidding about that form. It was really only seven pages long. <laughs> so why don't we have some questions uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll, uh, uh, so it, go ahead. We had originally thought we were going to have you all sign little cards, but instead it's probably going to be easier if you just stand up and ask your questions. I will recognize folks, and it's a great opportunity to be able to ask uh, Rick some questions. So let's just start right over there. Mm. And Rick, if you can repeat mm. the question if we can't hear it. Also, we were very afraid that if they did pass out the little basket they used for the donation, uh, <laughs> that, that, that there might be some Lutherans got in here by accident and they wouldn't ask their question because they would get confused and think it costs something. So we went, You're not a Lutheran, are you? <laughs> Lutherans are people too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I was going to get to that, but I ran out of time. What was the dog's name? Oddly enough, I have a story for that. Uh, when we got him, he, uh, he had a, uh, you know, he was good for two weeks, but he was just gathering his wind. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I can't even begin to tell you the, the havoc. You had to, I had to go back into antiqui antiquity to find words that summed up this dog's problems. Havoc, you know, was the, my favorite. Pandemonium was a good one. <laughs> and, um, and he, what he did was, um, we just couldn't give him a name because he, we were just so mad at him. And I can't say the names we called him in church. <laughs> so what we did, uh, I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And I also kept putting off 
taking him to the vet because, I, quite frankly, he showed us no signs that he would ever gentle down. or And he did not, um, he didn't have anything wrong with him that had to be addressed immediately. And, and stray dogs, and you all know this, are ticking time bombs. You know, they, you know, heartworms, you know. And I was kind of also afraid to do it. You know, I was dreading it. I know that makes no sense, but I was dreading doing it. And, um, and then uh, one day I said, okay, I can't put this off anymore. Tomorrow morning I'm going to fight him into the truck. I got so used to him biting me, it just didn't matter anymore. <laughs> and uh, I walked outside and he was gone. And uh, he was gone three days. And uh, I came and I drove the roads, you know, looking for him. And I don't know why. You know, it's a blessing. Uh, but one day, the third day, I pulled in the driveway and he was laying uh, at the top of the hill in a puddle of blood. And he tried to fight his way back into that confederacy of stray dogs and they had torn him up again. He just didn't understand quit. He just didn't know that. And uh, I scooped him up and, and took him to my truck and sat him down and went in to call the, the vet's office and tell him we were on our way. And I came out the door and my mama was was hunched over him, talking to him like he was a child, you know, talking to him like he was a human. And, and she, you know, I would had to get her to repeat it to me, but I heard her telling him, um, I think we'll name you after Geraldine Bundle. And I'm thinking to myself, Mom, that's a boy dog. I mean, uh, <laughs> And she, and she said, we'll name you after Geraldine Bundrum. Geraldine always wanted to go to Hollywood. And she always told us, I'm going to Hollywood. And she did. She went in a car and she went to Hollywood. And, you know, that part of the story is irrelevant. But she, uh, just talking to the dog. And she said, my daddy named Geraldine for all her freckles. She had freckles all over her face. She had a thousand freckles. So daddy nicknamed her the speckled beauty. So that's what we'll name you. We'll name you the speckled beauty. And uh, I scooped him up, took him to the vet and they glued him back together again. I mean, he was hurt and uh, I thought to myself, uh, that may be the best book title I've ever heard. <laughs> so that's that, the, and it may be the best dog's name I've ever heard. So we call him Speck for short. And, I, and if I take that much time to answer every question, we won't be here long. <laughs> Someone else? Yeah. Well, that was easy. <laughs> the answer to that is yes. <laughs> you want to go over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said you had lots of strays. Did all of them mean as much to you as the special No, ma'am. They were not my dog. Uh, now, some were. I, I, I had a a Weimaramer puppy that my Uncle John pulled out from under a barn that had been left to die and had one cloudy eye. Speck has, uh, I think this may be why they threw him out. I mean, he has all the instincts of a herder. And he is, as near as we can tell, mostly Australian Shepherd, allowing for maybe his mama not being real particular. I think his daddy was probably a traveling man. <laughs> uh, 
Pastor, do you like the way I handled that? You got to admit, that was pretty good. Uh, But I had a, a basset hound that strayed into the... It's funny, you know, uh, the beautiful dogs that people would just... But Speck had, um, had fought, and he had a black scar that ran across his left eye, like a, a magic marker line. And, and that eye is jet black. And now it's there... You know, it's the, 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 the eye is there. And if you tap the air above it, you know how you can you know, just do that? It will react. So he's got a little bit of sight in that eye. But I think that's why they threw him away. There's a chance he could be a purebred. I mean, he's, he's man, he's a magnificent dog otherwise. He's big bone for that breed and got a big old head and... He's a beautiful, I mean, really beautiful dog. Y'all can tell if you... I'm sitting here looking at him, and he makes me a little uneasy. Uh, um, plus the fact I took that photo when I shaved my beard off, and when you get to be 61, 62, don't ever shave your beard off. <laughs> because what you'll find looking back at you, Tony, tell him it ain't... It ain't always good. So, um, so, but he was the first one in a long time. I had not had a dog of my own for 30 years. I didn't like the idea of a town dog. Uh, I, I'm gone all the time. And up until COVID, I, you know, I flew all the time and I was always gone. And uh, now, if I'm gone longer than it takes to go get lunch in Jacksonville, he's mad. <laughs> and he has to be bribed. My mama has to stand on the porch beside him saying, now he'll bring you something. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know if y'all have ever had any good Huddle House bacon, but you know, it's probably the best bacon in history. And so, but he gets all my bacon. And, uh, and I have to sit there and hand feed him the bacon. And if I don't bring him the bacon, he will not look at me. <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's, not, he's beyond spoiled. He is, he's an abomination. <laughs> That's what he is. Someone else? Right down here in the front. I was going to say, how uh, you want Yeah. Well, thank you. Is your mama still cooking? She is still cooking. She gets mad that she can't see good anymore. And, and uh, to be brutally honest, you know, cornbread in our house, pretty good chance there's going to be a three alarm fire. <laughs> and, uh, and mama just doesn't give up on cornbread. And Someone else. This is one of real good opportunity. The gentleman in back. We've heard a lot about all the good things you've done for respect. What would you say is the greatest gift that you've ever given to you or that you've done for you? The question was, what is the, the greatest gift that Speck has, has given me? Well, I, I wrote, um, I kind of wrote that in, in here. Uh, People in the, where I'm from don't, and, and please, I don't want to insult anybody. I wouldn't do that for anything on earth. But if you go to the doctor where I'm from, then it's because you're wounded or you're very ill. You can't call in to work at the cotton mill and say, uh, yeah, boss, I'd love to be there today, but I'm in conflict with my inner child. <laughs> uh, that does not fly in Calhoun County. But that said, um, I had non-Hodgkins. I had um, chemo took my memory. And it didn't wipe it away, but it poked holes in it. 
and my memory was how I made my living. Uh, so it just burned holes in it. Strangest thing, you know. Um, and, and I had thought I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Turned out I ain't. And, and uh, so I managed to get through several, it's actually several years of, I mean, chemo, I don't have to explain it to a lot of you. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I wound up with a, you know, kidney failure and heart failure, all from a cheeseburger in 1977. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I was just kind of down. And, uh, and more than that, I, I just, uh, Larry McMurtry wrote it beautifully. He said, uh, some people are just born beside a river of melancholy. And uh, I have never been willing to stop working. Uh, I've risked my, not trying to be melodramatic, but I probably have risked my life and my job. You know, I've covered places that were dangerous. And so I, I always thought I was a tough guy. You know, ran a chainsaw, you know, swung a pick. I thought I was a tough guy. And then I just kind of reached an age where it just felt like there was more of my life. Um, behind me than ahead of me. And that everything else, as I wrote in the book, was kind of like cocktail hour at a Howard Johnson's. <laughs> and it just didn't, wasn't hopeful. And uh, if you have, if you have a slow day or, or a good day, then you want a good dog. You know, you want a good dog that'll come up and lay his head on your lap and, you know, and fetch a stick, you know. But if you have a melancholy day, a bad day, you need a bad dog. <laughs> Question down here. Let's see, did I see someone? There's a question over there. Yeah. Yes. With your hand. Yeah. I'm sorry, what now? Um, how therapeutic was the writing in this? You know, I, I'm going to sound very unwriterly. Because writers really want to make you believe that there's a mystery. You know, you know, I mean, you know, they want you to believe there's a real mystery to it. You know, that you're sitting there and you can't write and the, the muse flits in through the open window <laughs> on gossamer wings. Yep, just like that. And it lights on your shoulder and it begins to whisper words into your ear and you... Your fingers fl fly across the keyboard of your old Underwood typewriter because only a Philistine would write on a laptop. <laughs> and your fingers fly and they move so fast and with such power and with such beauty that you know, blood flies from your fingertips. And, uh, and then the muse just flits away. And you can't do anything after that. I don't believe in the muse. I believe in contracts and deadlines. And I think that the muse is always with you. It's that thing that bumps up under the bed in the middle of the night that tells you, hey, you got something to say, get up and do it. You got something to say, get up and do it. So I never believed in any of that. I didn't believe in therapy through writing. Writing's hard. You know, I'd, I'd rather eat a bug you know, I don't like to write. I like having written. And, uh, but I had never been down. Maybe I was down and I didn't know it. 
You know, I'd never been down before. So what happened was, you know, writing a story about a bad dog from a selfish standpoint would have been the best thing I could ever imagine. You know, to show that there was therapy in it. But then everybody else began to lose. You know, my brother got sick and my mama lost her people. And, and it went, it's still, uh, I believe, a very funny book. But, because he's just hilarious. But it became deeper and in places much sadder. And so I, it, I couldn't be selfish about it anymore. Does that make sense? You know, it, it became their book. And, and it became, like my sister-in-law came to a reading uh, in my hometown last night. And, you know, reading from it, I, I wondered every word, you know, is this good? You know, does this help her? And she cried, but I think she cried in a good way. So, yes, I think it was therapy, but I'm not sure it was mine, you know. Uh, have you ever been real good in dog bit? <laughs> you know how it is? I mean, man, when they really want to get you, and, and he would never hurt me. I mean, he's my bud. I mean, there's, you know, but if he's hurt, he can't stop himself, you know, from, from getting me. And man, you know, I got bit on the playground once at Roy Webb Junior High School. It didn't hurt that bad. <laughs> yeah, he, but, but. Uh, I'll stop stumbling around this. I wish I had been able to. It was just became a different book, a harder book, you know. Uh, and if you don't like it, uh, they're giving everybody triple their money back. <laughs> there was a lady over there with her hand up. Yes. Yeah. What made me move back to Alabama? Uh, my mama got my mama got sick. She, mama had had cancer. She had colon cancer, and a great surgeon at, at uh, Regional Medical Center in Anniston, Alabama, uh, gave her her life back. And uh, uh, she had a heart attack from too many buttered biscuits, and she's just can't see across the room. She has to like get spec to tell her what's happening on the Virginian. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not real good at, you know, I'm very, very good at, at, at what I do for a living. I really believe that. I'm not being smug. But I can, I can work. I just ain't real good at living. And, um, and when Mama got sick, that was something even I could figure out. I need to go home. Right? Can't be selfish, play in the fields of the Lord. You know? I need to go home. So I went home. And I am, I've had, uh, you know, we've done 12 books, six or seven bestsellers. And I live in my mama's basement. I have a house down on the Gulf Coast, down in Fairhope, Alabama. Have y'all been there? Down there. And it had a good little town. And the only problem with Fairhope is Fairhopians. Uh, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you turn your back on them, they'll run over you in their Land Rover. Uh, I'm there to bring the property values down. But I ain't been there in two years. I just, that's, yeah, that's, I am at Pageant. But I just, I needed to go home, you know. So I do the things now that I did when I was 16, 17, 18. I haul feed for livestock in my pickup. I uh, haul cement, bags of cement for my little brother. I, uh, haul gravel and patch the driveway. I burn brush, cut 40 acres of tornado damage just a few weeks ago and 
haul diesel fuel around. Got to be careful with diesel fuel. And uh, I do the things. I run a chainsaw. I do the things that I did when I was a boy. And and uh, and sometimes I, I you know I stop in the middle of like. You know, covering a brush pile with diesel fuel. Don't ever use gasoline. It's a really poor decision. Uh, and I, you know, and I think, man, I've seen a camel train vanish over the the horizon in Central Asia. I've heard the holy man's call to prayer. I've a, a, a voodoo priest in Haiti tried to turn me into a goat. <laughs> True story. Uh, the the bad guys who kicked the president out of the country hired the voodoo priest to um, to cow the the poor people, and so they you know he get right in, one of them he get right in front of me make he do like that and and I asked the I don't speak any Creole and I asked my interpreter I said what in the world is he saying and he said he has turned you into a goat. I thought, well, it'll probably, like, it's one of them delayed things. I'll probably, <laughs> with my luck, I'll wake up Thanksgiving and I'll be a goat. Uh, but I had to go home. And uh, there ain't nothing wrong with Alabama. We, we're a little slow about things like, you know, masks and <laughs> vaccines. If I could get 19 vaccines... I'd have 19 vaccines, you know. I mean, I'd stand in line and say, give me 18 more, you know. Uh, but I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, there's nowhere else I can be. I have to be, I have to be home. And uh, it's all right. It's okay. Someone let's, else? Let's just do a couple more questions. Do we have questions um, oh, right up here. I'm sorry, y'all didn't fill out the form. You don't get to ask a question. In where I come from, later, in one of the later chapters, you write about uh, if you don't tell their story, who's going to tell it? And I don't know that I really have a question, but you know, that just kind of spoke to me. Well, thank you. I, you know, that uh, the question was... The, 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 was uh, one of the little essays in this collection of essays. Essays are the best thing in the world to write because you get paid twice, <laughs> you know, and you only have to write once. If you are a lazy man that doesn't really like writing, trust me, y'all, that's the way to go. And But there was a little essay, and it ran many years ago. Most of those essays were just in the past few years, I've done a couple of collect, three collections of essays. But that one was just, a, again, 10 years, or maybe even longer. Uh, and I just wrote about why I like to write about the working people, the blue collar people of the foothills of the Appalachians. And <clears throat> look, you can put on as many airs as you want to, but if you scratch most people in the deep south, one or two layers down, you will find somebody that worked beside machines in a cotton mill. And, uh, and you know, wrist their fingers, hands, and arms. You'll find somebody uh, fighting black lung. You'll find people who know what it's like in a sweatshop because they're being hurried to miss, just miss and get that needle in their fingernail. So, you know, I, I don't know. I've, technically, I'm still a freshman at Jacksonville State University. <laughs> <coughs> and, and people will say sometimes, well, you know, no, you're not. You went to Harvard. I went to Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship. It's something that you win like an award. So for a year, I didn't have to work. All I did was read, read history, listen to smart people talk about things I needed to know something about. But they didn't give me a degree, you know. 
But for a year, I got to listen to these smart people talk. But I don't, I have no interest in writing about any other class but mine. Um, I'm going Friday. Uh, Friday, I got to go to the, um, uh, to Montgomery. Um, there's an award, the, the, uh, the F. Scott Fitzgerald Award, F. Scott and Zelda Award, because it's in Montgomery. <clears throat> and uh, I guess they, their white trash quotient had not been filled. <laughs> so they gave it to me, and I'm going to go down and get it uh, Friday, and we're going to do a book event like this, although not nearly as nice. And, uh, and, uh, they asked me, what did Fitzgerald mean to me? And for a while I had, I didn't know what to say because, you know, old money, I don't know anything about old money. You know, the, the, the jazz age, opulence, I don't know anything about that. But I can tell you that if you're running a Poulan chainsaw and you're standing in pine branches, lemon them to load on a pulpwood truck. If you hear, if you let off the trigger and the rumble of that saw is real low, it's not that clang like you get, it's very low. You can hear the rattles of rattles, like you can hear them and you freeze and your heart freezes and you look around your legs and you try to find it. But I found in over the years, if you can find him, if you'll hit the trigger again and point the blade at him, he'll commit suicide. <laughs> That's not fiction. You know, I know that. I know that if you snub a cow against a pine tree, being careful not to let it pinch your fingers off, and you doctor them for pink eye, you just don't like get to like spray their eye you got to stick them with a needle like, you know, that long. And, and once some of my dummy friends thought it'd be funny to like stick each other. <laughs> and, uh, that wasn't wise. <laughs> but I have no interest in writing about ease. But that's a good question or a very nice thing to say. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Let's do one last question. One last question. Last opportunity, because I'm right here in front. What is your favorite memory of coming to Atlanta? <laughs> what is my favorite memory of coming to Atlanta? Oh, man. So we'll exclude old girlfriends from this? <laughs> we will exclude old girlfriends from this. Okay, here, and I'll, this is great to end on, and I mean, great to end on. People love to hate Atlanta. You know, they love to hate Atlanta. And the fact is, they don't know how to treat Atlanta. What you do is, you, you find your dog trails. You know, you find your trails. My trail was Ponce de Leon. And, you know, uh, I'm... I remember going to the colonnade on the Cheshire Bridge Road. And I remember uh, there was a, a, a wonderful woman who worked in the Atlanta Bureau of the New York Times named Susan Taylor, wonderful person. And she always said, now be careful, because if you go there on Tuesday at ladies lunch, I didn't know there was such a thing as ladies lunch. You got to be careful because they drink them pink Bloody Marys that they're, you know, they're supposed to be Bloody Marys, but they got so much liquor in them, they're pink. And they come out of that parking lot in their Cadillacs and they come out of there sideways. And if you're in their way, you're just gone. You know, uh, how do you not, how do you not? love a place where you can walk in the door of a fast food restaurant 
or fight your way through the door of a fast food restaurant. And all you got to remember is two chili dogs with onions wrapped in wax paper, <laughs> onion rings, and a big orange. And, and that's, that's all you got to do. Uh, I remember Thelma Grundy's. Uh, I, you know, God, it seems like it, food is what I mostly remember. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, yeah, thank God them days are over. Uh, but I, you learn that, like, even the things that are just wrong are, are kind of endearing. Like, you know, that stretch of, is it juniper? What does Piedmont turn into when you're coming back toward town? Y'all know what I'm talking about when Piedmont splits? And is that it, Cor Cortland? Is that what it is? How, after all this time, have Atlanta's not figured out that the left-hand lane, which is only this wide, is not for driving. It is for stopping at a dead stop and having someone like, I don't know, uh, read you Shakespeare or whatever is going on. Or, you know, the, 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 traffic does not flow in the left-hand lane. It was never intended to flow. It can't flow. It's this wide. And, and uh, I lived in, uh, at the, near the corner of Myrtle and Forth. And uh, I'd wake up every morning smelling like Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> and I read a column recently by some, reporters are not like they used to be. Reporters used to be uh, like me. They used to be slovenly. You know, they used to be kind of, no matter how, we were talking with the, the pastor and, you know, uh, I, 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 I called him a skinny guy. He don't understand that in the parlance of a fat guy, anybody skinnier than you is a skinny guy. And, 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 and I just hate the skinny guys because they, you know, they can wear anything. They can put anything on look good. I look homeless no matter what I put on. And, uh, but I, I remember a, a modern day reporter saying, yes, you know, I just despise that sugary, greasy smell from the Krispy Kreme. I thought to myself, what kind of human being on this planet? <laughs> I mean, even if you're not allowed to have a Krispy Kreme donut, who wants to begrudge humankind a Krispy Kreme donut? So I, I, my feelings about Atlanta have always been, find your dog trails and you'll be fine. If you have to get on that loop, <laughs> then with all due respect, pastor, just give yourself to God. This is the uh, Carter Library's very first in-person author event in a year and a half, and I cannot think of a better person to have here than Rick Brown. Um, one reminder, I know you all have your signed copies of The Speckled Beauty. Um, you, I just want to make sure you also know that Acapella Books has signed copies of his first book, All Over But the Shouting, which is, if you haven't read it, is a fabulous book. They've got those in the lobby as well. Let us thank Rick Braggs one more time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.
to be honest with you, Steph cannot be trusted. Not that <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all for coming here.